Father, this, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can call on your name, Lord God. We thank you that we can pray and we can worship you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you that we can gather in this place, Lord, in your holy house on this Sunday morning. We thank you that Jesus is Lord and that your Holy Spirit is with us. We thank you that we can begin an Advent season excited about the things of God, knowing that the Lord is Lord of our lives. Lord, we bring these requests to you, Lord, after we praise you and manifest your name, Lord, and we worshiped you and we sung songs to you, God, and we told you how much we love you. We're excited about your coming, Lord God, and we praise you, Father. And now, Lord, we come before you with requests, Lord, because you said that you are God who not only hears prayers, but a God who answers prayers. So I'd like to bring Barb Musselman, Mark Zimmerman, and Adelio Martinez before you, Lord God. Each one of those people was brought up before the first service and asked for prayer requests because they're battling illness, Lord. And they need you, Lord Jesus. They need you to touch them physically, Lord God. Adelio Martinez is battling cancer, Father God. He really needs you, Lord God. Larry Myers also needs you, Lord, for he is battling cancer and was just told that he has six months to live, six months to a year to live. And he's battling serious liver issues, Lord God, and he really needs salvation, Father. And we pray, Lord, that even though the shock of the little C is hitting him right now, that he will have an encounter with the big C, Jesus Christ, and that you will transform his life, Father. Open up doors for Larry, God. Gives wisdom, Lord Jesus, to work with him, Father. Draw him to you, Lord Jesus. We also pray for Larry Wright, who has stage four cancer, Lord God. We pray that you would touch him also, Lord, as well as Amy Whitcomb, who has stage one breast cancer, Lord. A lot of people dealing with cancer this year, Father. Well, we lift them up before you, Lord Jesus, and ask that you would touch them, Father. We pray for Alyssa, it says, having her baby boy today, Lord. We pray that if she's getting ready to deliver, that it'll be healthy, Father God, that you will bless her, Lord. It's the expected mom that she is, that it will go well, and that this baby will come into the world praising and glorifying your name, Lord. We pray for Savannah, Lord God, as we always continue to pray for her, Lord God. I believe she just had her test recently for nursing, Lord. No, she battles migraines. We pray for her. We also pray for Sherry. Her legs are swollen and in pain. And there's one is Cheryl's daughter, Cheryl Berkebaugh's daughter. Another is her granddaughter. We pray for both of them, Lord God, that you would just be with them, Lord Jesus, and touch them. We thank you that Carolyn Garlock is back in the house, Lord God, after we prayed for her, Jesus, for blood clots that she was experiencing and found out that they could be treated with medication. We give you all the glory and the honor for that, Lord Jesus. And we praise you for that, Lord Jesus. I pray for my youngest brother, Kenmore, Lord God, for wisdom, Lord, situation that he's going through, Lord God, and I need to call him, and I need you to tell me what to say, Father. It's a lot of deception at work there, Father, and we just need wisdom, so guide and direct, Lord, and let me know what your timing is for that, Lord God. Finally, Lord, I lift up these electronic Bibles to you, Lord Jesus. Written in the language of Ethiopia, and one is actually talking to me. So I'm hearing the language. But they're going to be, Lord, delivered to the people of Ethiopia and handed out, Father when they're taken in March. I pray, Lord God, that your anointing will rest upon each one of those electronic Bibles. I pray that when they're handed to the person, when they take them in their hand, that the Spirit will jump right off the Bible and right onto them, Lord. That the words will, will touch them and pierce their hearts, Lord God, and lead them to salvation. I pray that you direct the workers that are going, I believe it's Stephanie Yeager that's taking them, 
that you direct all of those that are traveling along with her and the guy that does the ARC ministry, that you direct them to hand them to the people that you've already selected, Father, to receive the word, and that your blessing would be upon them, Lord God. I pray for all that's going on this week in the church, Lord God. I pray for the Wednesday night prayer. I pray for Friday night's young adults meeting, Lord. As we combine with the focused leadership, Lord, I pray that you just pour out your spirit upon that day, Lord. I pray for Pastor Larry, who still hasn't feeling 100% right, but that you just touch him and raise him up, Father, and strengthen him, Lord God, our, our leader, Lord, and our shepherd, that you just bless him, Father. Now, Lord, as we get ready to get into the word today, Father, bring forth clarity, bring forth understanding, Lord Jesus. Speak to us on what you would have to say to the church. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All of the music and the testimonies and everything that was going forward so far today has kind of led up to what I'm going to be talking about today. And I would say ironically, but we know with God, nothing's ironic. It's all divinely led, but... Today is the first day of a season called Advent, which the world calls the holidays. So now that we're in the holidays, we're going to take a look at the Advent season, what it's all about, and what we're supposed to be looking for over these next four weeks. Now, what is Advent? Now, for those of you who are like me, who were not raised up in the church, because we didn't talk about Advent on the streets of the Bronx, but you might not know exactly what it is. What Advent is, it's the, fir it's the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. That season is called the Advent season. And the first day of Advent begins today, the 29th, the first Sunday, and we lit the first candle. And then each subsequent Sunday after this, another candle is lit. And the last one to be lit, which would be in the center where the red holly is, would be the Jesus candle. The, you light that on Christmas for his birth. And it's a looking forward to Jesus. But it's interesting because Advent started out very different than what we think about when we think of Advent. During the 4th and the 5th century, many scholars believe that it originated actually in Spain or an area called Galt, which is outside of Spain. And at that time, it was really kind of a season of preparation, almost like Lent is prior to Easter. Advent was a season of preparation, and it was a preparation for the baptism of new believers into the Christian faith. And that was done at something called the Feast of Epiphany, which occurred on January 6th. Now, What's significant about that day, the, Fe the Feast of Epiphany or January 6th, is that for many cultures, for example, in Puerto Rico, on the 6th of January, many people would put hay under their house. Why? Because they believed that that was the day that the wise men came to see Jesus. And so Christmas not only goes to the 25th when Jesus was born, but all the way to January, they celebrate and even celebrating the arrival of the wise men. So this was a preparation for early Christians of people that had just recently been saved. This Advent time was a time, all right, set aside, separate, look, look to where you're at, look to God, prepare yourself, because coming up in the Feast of, Ascent, of Epiphany, we're going to baptize you, you're going to declare outwardly to the world what Christ has done inside of you. In, in your heart, and everyone will know you're a Christian, and because it's not a light, trivial thing, take some time to really think about what you're doing and prepare your heart. By the 6th century, it began to change, and then the Roman Christians started to look at Advent not just for preparation for new believers, but they started to look at Advent as looking forward to the coming of Christ. Not the coming of Christ on Christmas as a babe in a manger, but for the coming of Christ when he would come as a risen Savior and as Lord to redeem his people. The second coming. The first one, he came in a manger in, in Bethlehem, but the second coming would be on the clouds as judge and king of the world. And Advent for the, for the sixth century Roman Christians began to be about that, looking towards Jesus' second coming. 
By the Middle Ages, the shift began to change, and then for the first time, Advent was linked to Christ's first coming at Christmas. And then it began that season leading up to the birth of Christ and looking forward to that which was done and how we should prepare our hearts to seek God during this particular season prior to the birth of Christ. Now, while it's difficult to keep in mind in the midst of holiday celebrations, shopping and lights and Hershey Park decorations and Christmas carols, Advent was intended to be a season of fasting, very much like Lent. And there were a variety of ways that this time of mourning worked itself out in the season. One thing that people were supposed to do during Advent was reflect on the violence and evil that was taking place in the world and cause it to stir something up in you that will cause you to cry out to God to make things right, to put to death dark shadows and send them fleeing back to the pits of hell where they belong. In fact, it was meant to to come against all of the things that are going on around us and really strongly see God knowing that, that something wonderful was happening and had happened during this season and that we could come against that, the things of darkness in the light of what God had done during this Advent season. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, that great evangelist from Europe, who was raised up, said this powerfully. He used to speak out of Germany and stuff like that. He, made a, he had a quote about Advent. He said, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, and who look forward to something greater to come. Jesus said, blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. In other words, Advent was a time to look and realize who we are and where we are and who God is and who he is and recognize that we need him now more than ever and that we desperately need the Lord to come into our lives. And it was a time where we would seriously seek God as never before. Interesting. We have Advent season before Jesus' birth. We have Lent before his death. These are periods of time where we really stop and think about what God has done, both in his birth and in his death, and really focus on the Lord. So we're going to look at something at Advent from, a di from two different points of view. We're going to look at Advent and this Christmas season from 2,000 years ago, and then we're going to look at this Christmas season in the year 2020 and see what God is doing in both time periods. The first thing that we know about Advent is this, that the season has begun. And there's obviously, as you can see, the under tagline, the world versus the church. The Christmas season or Advent season, and I'm going to use the terms interchangeably, has begun. In other words, we're already in the throes of the Christmas season. It begins officially on Thanksgiving, at least in the United States, and goes all the way through to New Year's, and it's usually culminated by how much money you can spend, how much presents you can buy, how much alcohol you can drink, how much parties you can attend, how much merriment you can have, how many ugly Christmas sweaters you can buy, and it's all a season of merriment and partying and funds according to the world. In fact, this year we're in the middle of a pandemic, so the, the Christmas season this year looks a little bit different because it looks like this. Even Santa is wearing a mask. So we're in the throes of the Christmas season. And how do we know? Because the Black Friday sales have already gone on. And if you hear the news ad nauseum, all you hear about is how record-breaking sales of online merchandise this year and the troubles with shipping that they're expecting and how people are out there buying stuff and, you know, they're complaining about people going to see their families and, you know, it's, you can't go see your family, but you can go into Walmart the next day. I won't even go into that one, you know, but 
But all this stuff that's going on in the world's talk about it, and I'm like, how do they know how much money a person's going to spend? They're averaging $900 this year on Christmas gifts. Who has $900 to spend on Christmas? Mm -hmm. And where do they come up with that? And why do they waste time coming up with that? Mm -hmm. But because for the world, that's what the Christmas season is all about. You know, it's about that shopping and buying stuff and things like that. And it begins in, in, in Thanksgiving, and then there's this mad rush to make it special, especially in this year where we have a pandemic and where people want to get back to some kind of normality and some kind of normal. They're looking at Christmas to make people feel normal again or feel hope or feel something special. The problem is Christmas is not about the presence. Christmas is about the person whose name is Jesus Christ. And if you leave him out of Christmas, you just have another day where people can buy stuff eat a lot of food, and get fat. What we know about Advent 3,000 years ago, right, this Christmas season, was it began with a promise. And the promise is in a very obscure verse of Scripture in the book of Micah. And I'm going back to the fifth chapter of Micah. This is when Advent actually begins, when it's first talked about this Christmas season or this season leading up to the birth of Jesus. For in Micah chapter 5, verse 1, I love the prophet Micah. He has one of my favorite, favorite verses. He has a verse in Micah that says, the voice of the Lord cries unto the city. I love that. The voice of the Lord cries unto the city, speaking out. But in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrata, least among the clans of Judah, from out of you shall come forth one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient times. Out of you, this little insignificant town in Judah, in a place called Bethlehem, is going to come one who is from everlasting to everlasting. A promise is put forth way before it actually happens because the Advent season for believers began with a promise. Now, why was that promise given? If you want to know what was happening at the time that that promise was made or that prophecy was made, you have to go back to the previous chapter, the fourth chapter. And right at the end of the fourth chapter, leading up to the fifth, where God speaks about the coming Messiah, this is the state that Israel is going through. He says, but right now, they're ganging up against you. Godless people are saying, kick her when she's down. Who's her? Israel. Violate her. We want to see Zion grovel in the dirt. These blasphemers, they have no idea what God is thinking and doing in this. They don't know that this is the making of God's people and that they are wheat being threshed and gold being refined. They have no idea what God's doing. In other words, all the enemies of, of the nation of Israel were attacking and wreaking havoc against the nation of Israel and the people were going through changes and God speaks this promise. In the midst of all of this, I am doing something special and watch what happens because in the loneliest of places, in the midst of your discouragement, in the midst of your persecution, in the midst of all that is assailed against you, I am going to bring forth one who is ruler over all those that are attacked you and watch when I make it come to pass. If there was ever a time that we needed to understand this, it's nowadays because the church in 2020 is going through the same kind of persecution that Israel was going through back during the days of Micah. Don't tell me that the forces of evil aren't against us. They're, they're, every time you turn around, they're belittling God. Andrew Cuomo, I mean, I'm from New York. It can't stand me that this guy stands up there and says, God didn't bring the numbers down. We did. Right. And then just this past week, our Supreme Court rules that that against him that he can't eliminate or limit the amount of people that can gather together in a church service because it's unconstitutional. And Yahoo has the nerve to say there's something wrong with the Supreme Court. There's something wrong with the court because they decide to, start to stand with God and make righteous decisions based on their understanding of the Constitution and faith in Christ. And there's something wrong with that. No, there's something wrong with the 
world that's getting further and further away from God, that in the midst of a pandemic where 200 plus thousand people are dead, we're still so arrogant that we can't humble ourselves, get on our knees, cry out to God, ask him to forgive us for our stupidity and call on him to heal this land the way he wants to do. The first thing that we understand is that the season has begun. Like I said, we've had the Macy's Parade. That ushered it in. We've got the Black Friday sales. This week, the Rockefeller tree goes up. Everybody's in the stores, online shopping and stuff like that. The world's going through its thing, and they're doing what they do. Right? And we have Advent. We lit a candle. And our candle signifies that we're going to be looking to the Lord for this Christmas season. The next four weeks leading up to the birth of Christ. Why is it so important that we as believers do that? Because we don't want to get caught up in the world and its distractions of things that are totally meaningless and really don't matter in the end. Didn't we just learn a lesson in 2020? Everything that we put stock in, entertainment and movies and concerts and all the stuff that we spent all our lives wrapped up in was ripped away from us and taken and you know what was left God and yet we still long for all the things that really don't satisfy we long for the things we want that normal back again I don't want to go back to the normal way things were I want to see a nation that's calling on the name of the Lord that's transformed by the power of Jesus Christ why would I want to go back to what was before The first thing that we know about the Advent season is that this, and it happened 2,000 years ago, and it's happening today as well, and it's this. God always provides a sign. When God is about to do something, he will always provide a sign that he's working on our behalf and he's moving. 2,000 years ago, it was a star that made its appearance in the sky. And unfortunately, most people were so dense and so far from God, they didn't even realize what was happening except for a couple of wise men, however many there was, we don't know, that looked and said, oh, look, a star, a king is about to be born. Let's get up and start to move and find out who he is. The rest of the world was totally clueless just like they are in 2020. God is moving left and right and had the world by and, more, for, by and large for the most part has no clue that God is even doing anything special. But we see it all the time. How do we know that God's providing a sign? Because someone could stand up in front of the church and say they said why aren't you answering your email? What email? I never got it. Well there's a job waiting for you. You just don't know it yet. But God has already opened the door. He's shown you yes you're going to be a teacher. Why is he showing you that? Because God's trying to tell you I'm still working in 2020. Even though we're in the middle of a pandemic I'm still working in 2020. I'm still moving. God is providing a sign. They just came up with a vaccine, right? We started in March. This is November. Seven months, more or less. That's unheard of in the medical community. They never come up with a vaccine that fast. Whether you like it or not, the fact that it's here shows that God must be moving in somebody's life to give them the reality to be able to see and do the research and realize, oh, we could create this vaccine and this could come against this virus. Well, where did the brains come from that were put in the heads of the scientists that came up with this? It didn't get manufactured out of Play-Doh. God created it. God is moving. God is working. God is showing us in the midst of the pandemic, I am moving. And he's showing us left and right, constantly pouring out signs that he's here. There's more people that are open to the gospel now that have been in a long time because they're scared. And when you're scared, you'll actually listen when somebody tells you about Jesus. He's performing a sign. The second thing we know about this is that Mary is pregnant. God gave a sign that he was going to send the king. So then he comes up, the angel comes to Mary and says, fear not, Mary, you have found favor with God. In Luke chapter 1, verse 30 and 33, and I'm reading our New American Standard Bible, it says this. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. 
And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, including 2020. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. Outstanding, unheard of. How is this possible? Because with God, all things are possible. First, he sends a sign, right, that he's moving 2,000 years ago and that he's moving in our lives today. And the second thing is that he begins to come upon someone who becomes pregnant and is carrying the Christ child who will be born in a manger in Bethlehem. How does that apply to 2020? God has given us a sign that he's working and that he's moving in our lives and that he's here every day. But God is always about the process of birthing something new in our lives. What is God birthing in you during this Advent season? Are you looking to God for the new thing he's doing in you? Is it maybe birthing you out of complacency into being filled with the Holy Spirit? Is he birthing you out of, out of lackluster spirituality to the point where you're on fire for God and just love the Lord? Is he birthing a timidity out of you and filling you with the strength and the boldness to speak the gospel? What is God birthing in you during this Advent season? Because something is coming forward. We know that Mary is pregnant. The next thing that we know is that they begin to prepare for a journey. They're prep preparing for a journey. And so this is the interesting thing about this whole thing with Bethlehem and the journey. So you got to look back 2,000 years ago. It was about 60 to 70 miles from, from Nazareth in the north to Bethlehem in the south. Which, if you average... 20 miles a day, which is what they think most people would walk, would take you about five days or so, four to five days, something like that, if you went the straightest route. The problem was that between Bethlehem, between Nazareth and Bethlehem was a little area called Samaria. Anyone ever heard of the Samaritans? You know how well the Jews and them got along, right? They didn't. In fact, they hated one another. So oftentimes what would happen is that the Jews would go around Samaria, which would add to their trip and make it even longer. They would take what was called the trade route, which ran along the Jordan River, down, they would cut east from, from Nazareth, down along the edge of Samaria, and then back west to go to Bethlehem. So that would add time to the trip. So during this Advent season, the preparation is already being made for the baby to be born. In other words, the preparation is already being made for Mary and Joseph to be in the place where God wants them to be so that he can bring forth that which he wants to bring forth. So for us in 2020, are you preparing for God to bring you to that place where he wants you to be so that he can bring forth that which he wants to bring forth in your life during this Advent season. Are you getting ready for the journey? Are you looking at the fact that, okay, we lit this first candle, this Advent season is starting up. God, I know that you're getting ready to do something, Lord. Bring me to the place where I need to be, Father. Whether it means that I need to be more diligent in prayer with you or spend time with you, whatever it is, bring me, Lord God, and get me prepared and ready for this journey, Father God. And so, they prepared to go on this journey. And then the other interesting thing is this. So she's very pregnant. I doubt very much if she would have been able to do 20 miles in a day. Add to that, that's a nice picture, right, of Mary and stuff and Joseph leading them, but it's not really biblically accurate. And I'm going to tell you why. There is no place in the Bible where it says she rode a donkey to Bethlehem, right? There's a couple of places like that that we misunderstand. Like when Paul heard Jesus Christ and got an encounter with Jesus, we always think he got knocked off his horse, but the Bible doesn't say he was on a horse. It doesn't say that Mary had a donkey either. 
right? It does say that they were very poor because when they got to Jerusalem, they sacrificed two turtle doves, which is the sacrifice of the very poorest people. Whoever they travel with, they would have more than likely been walking. As a pregnant woman late in, in her trimester, she wouldn't be doing no 20 miles in a day. If she was, well, more power to her. Right? So the journey that normally would take four or five days could have took them up to two weeks. So figure now we're in this Advent season. They're preparing to leave. They're looking at a journey, and part of the time before the birth of Christ, they're moving towards that place where God is getting ready to do something incredible. The challenge for us is, are we moving towards that place where God is getting ready to do something incredible so that we're positioned where he needs us to be when he begins to outpour his spirit in a power? Powerful and new way. And there's been so many people praying that God really does something powerful and prayerful in this nation, especially during this time, that I have no doubt that God is going to move in incredible ways. I don't even think we understand half of what God's about to do. We're looking at all the circumstances around us and all the negativity, and we're so caught up in that, and we're so fearful that we've lost sight of the fact that in the midst of the most difficult circumstances, that God moves powerfully and does incredible things that we can't even imagine. The other thing is that Mary was like any expectant mother. She was excited and she was looking forward to the birth of this child. Why was she so excited? Because she knew that she was carrying the Son of God, the Christ child, God with her inside of her womb. Why should we be excited in 2020? Because we know that, one, we're in the Advent season. It's already started. We know that, two, a promise was made that God is going to be with us always, even to the end of the age. That means he was there 2,000 years ago. That means he's there today with us. We know that he's giving us signs each and every day that he is functioning and he is active and that this Advent season, as people's hearts are sensitive and they're more likely to be turned towards the things of God, it allows the Spirit of God to be able to move in greater and more powerful ways. We understand that. So when we look at this Christmas, we don't look at it cowering in fear because of coronavirus or because of the political climate. We look towards this Christmas season with excitement and joy because Jesus is on the throne and nobody can, th can kick him off office. You can't reelect him or kick him out every four years. Amen. He stays on the throne and he's always there. The same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Jesus that set us free from sin and death when we came to know him is the same Jesus that's alive and working in us today. Oh, this Advent season is going to be very different for a lot of us. All of the traditional stuff that we get so hung up on has been taken away. Now we can clearly focus on what really matters, him and him alone. We look expectantly. Now, ironically enough, what happened 2,000 years ago or, you know, is the same thing that's happening today. God has sent a sign that only a few people picked up on. He began to impregnate Mary, and the Spirit of God came upon her, and she was going to start birthing this Christ child, bringing this, this wonderful, amazing blessing into the world. They began to prepare for their journey, and during the Advent season started traveling to that place where God needed them to be. But all the time that God was moving, all the time that God was showing forth a sign that he was getting ready to do something incredible, all the time that he had already impregnated Mary and that they were moving into the position where they needed to be for God to deliver that promise that he delivered, the vast majority of the people had no clue what was going on. Dense, dumb didn't even realize that God was moving, going about their lives, doing what they do every day, totally devoid of any understanding, of any clarity. They couldn't even see God in front of them if it was a gnat on an apple pie. Blind. Blind. So they arrive in Jerusalem. We know that from the story, and the people don't even know why they're there. What are you doing there? These these wise men come, and the interesting thing is the way we know that they had no clue was this. Because when Herod said that the wise men did this, let me find it. Okay. After Jesus had come, right? It says, after Jesus was born. So we know the promise happened. We know that Jesus was born. 
other than a few shepherds who were told about it that night when the angels shone up above them and the whole glory of heaven was revealed and they came running to the, to the manger scene or cave or whatever it was, or some people believe it could have been even in a relative's house in the basement. It depends on how you define the word no room in the inn, right? When the angels and the shepherds came and they came to view the baby Jesus and they saw him, other than that, most everybody didn't know what was going on. In fact, after the promise had been delivered and Jesus was in this earth, they still didn't know what was going on. And the reason we know is because when the wise men show up, they knew what was going on. They recognized that something was happening. And they followed this star all the way through till the time Jesus was born until it led them to find them. And it says in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem village, during Herod's kingship, that a band of scholars arrived in Jerusalem from the east, and they asked around, where can we find and pay homage to the newborn king of the Jews? For we observed the star in the eastern sky that signaled his birth, and we're on a pilgrimage to worship him. And the very next line is said, and Herod and all of Jerusalem were scared when they heard that. They had no clue that God had done an amazing miraculous work right under their noses because most of the world is dead to what Jesus is doing. They can't even see it right in front of their face. That's why we have to tell them. They walked into that, that, that palace and they stood in front of Herod and all the religious people and all the Pharisees. And it's a shame. The Pharisees, which were the religious people, had no clue what God was doing. That's, I won't even get into that when the godly, godly people don't know that God is doing anything. So they stand in front of all these people and the Pharisees with their nice long robes and there's Herod with his crown and his kingly stuff and they speak boldly, where is he? Where is he? Well, who's he? The king of the Jews. What king? I'm the king of the Jews. No, no. The one that was born. We saw his star in the east and we've come to worship. God has done something incredible. Where is it? We want to see it. Show us. We don't know anything about that. We don't know anything about it. What are you talking about? No, God showed us he's coming. This Advent season, as we look forward in 2020, we look and say, God, what are you doing in this year, in this season? What are you doing in our lives? What are you bringing forth, Lord? What are you birthing, Lord God? Let our minds be focused on you, Lord Jesus, directed towards you and what you're doing. I don't want to be distracted like the world. I don't want to be dense and not realize that Jesus is moving because you've shown us in so many ways. How do we know? Because you've given us a sign. You told us, I will always be with you each and every day, always to the end of the age. And then you rose from the grave, from the from in front of the disciples, and you went up in heaven and said, the same way I'm going up, I'm going to come back for you. But you told us then, I will never leave you. I will always be with you. And I'm holding on to that sign that you are always going to be with us each and every day. How many prayer requests have been answered that prove to us that God is real and that he's with us every day? How many open doors has Jesus done for people in this congregation where it shouldn't have never happened, where God has created a way out of nowhere? What does it take to get you to realize that God is speaking loud and clear? The voice of the Lord cries unto Glenvale Church. We know that during this Advent season that God is birthing something new out of all the pain and all of the suffering that 2020 has brought. My Bible says what Satan means for evil, God turns around for good. And so we have to recognize that, yes, we're in a pandemic. Yes, things are rough. Yes, there's despair. Yes, things are bad. But God is on the throne, and he's still going to move and transform and change people's lives. We know that the journey has begun, that God is moving everything in heaven and earth. 2,000 years ago, it was a couple that left the village in Nazareth and started a long, arduous trek 70 miles south to a town called Bethlehem. And they had to overcome obstacles and walk, and she was very pregnant, and the difficulties of that, and traveling. And they had to deal with robbers on the road and, and forces that were assailed against them. And do you think that Satan was saying, oh, great, the Son of God is going to be gone. Oh, good, you get to Bethlehem. Bethlehem. He was probably a, a coming against them all kind of ways. He didn't want to see Jesus born because he knew it would be a threat to his reign and end what he was trying to do. 
the journey had begun. They were moving to where they had to be to be able to bring forth that which God was birthing in this world. We have to do the same thing. God, journey us to where you want us to be so that you can birth in us that thing that you're bringing forward that's going to transform us in the year 2020. All this hasn't happened for nothing, Lord God. You're in the midst of everything, and you use all things together for good, and we're going to hang on to that, and we're going to trust you. We live in a world that's clueless, that doesn't even know what's going on. God is moving left and right, and they're so hung up and wanting to be normal that they don't even realize that God is blessing them and showing them what real normality is. Real normal is being filled with the Holy Spirit, having communion with God, calling on the name of Jesus, and looking to him as the author and the finisher of your faith. Everything else is abnormal. And what we say we want is normal is really abnormal. We don't want to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We want to be able to go out and have fun and go to concerts and spend money and go have a drink in the bar and do all this stuff. And, you know, each and everything like that has its place. But don't put it before the Lord. Normal is a person that's sold out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, filled with the Holy Spirit, that's able to go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly to a world that's dying. This Advent season, as we look towards Jesus Christ and his coming each and every week when another candle is lit, Lord, how are we? This is week two in my journey to get to the place where you need me to be, where you could pour out your blessing upon me, Lord. Am I there, Father? What is it that I need to do, Lord? Fill me, Lord. Is it me too much that I'm thinking about, Lord? Take it away from me. What do I need? God, show me. Reveal yourself to me, Lord Jesus. Direct and guide me. That's what we should be looking at this Advent season. What God is trying to do. Because he definitely wants to do something in the year 2020. We've been beat up. We've been bruised. We've been smacked around. We've been belittled. We've been driven by fear. And it's time that we guard our heart and take it and put it in Jesus' hands and say, Enough! I'm not going to let this world scare me anymore. I'm not going to cower in fear. I'm not going to go go sniveling around and let the enemy just beat up on me and beat up on my family and tear people apart and destroy things. I'm enough. I'm going to stand with Jesus Christ. I'm going to put my trust in him. I'm going to believe in him wholeheartedly. I'm going to stand for Jesus. I'm going to shout hallelujah all the way from now to December 25th. And on December 25th, I'll say glory. Praise you, Jesus, for the Son of God seeks to save that which is lost. So what's the holidays going to be like for you? Now that we're in this holidays, what's it going to be like for you? Do you get caught up in the world's idea of holiday? Where you go out and get the turkey and the stuffing, mashed potatoes, buy the PlayStation 5. Oh, I wish. Mm. Right. Get the latest laptop, mm. buy the newest video game. Mm. Do you get caught up in the, the trappings and the presents and all that stuff? And there's nothing is anything wrong with that as long as it's kept in its proper place. How about you gift the gift of thanks? Lord, thank you, Jesus. For the Christmas season, Lord. Lord, I give you a gift during this Advent season. I give you the gift of my heart, Lord God. Take it. Do with it as you see fit, Lord. How about we bless Jesus this Advent season and challenge our world who is dying and looking for normal and remind people normal is a heart sold out to Jesus Christ filled with the Holy Spirit. Everything else is a waste of time. Bow our heads. Father, we praise you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Lord God, for this time period we call Advent. As we look towards the holidays, look towards the coming of Christ's birth. For us, looking back 2,000 years ago, we remember what was done, Lord. We remember that a young couple left their home and took an arduous journey and traveled south, probably up to two weeks, to get to the place where you were going to bring forth the Christ child. 
We remember that you gave us signs and prophecies and that you fulfilled every single one of them. We remember that the, the greatest miracle of all came from the most insecure little place on the map, reminding us that you do the most incredible things in the simplest of people. That you don't care about the high and mighty, you care about the humble and the lowly. And that you move mightily, Lord God. And it's a reminder that we are in a time period, much like Israel was during the days of Micah, where we're being assailed and attacked, but we remember the promise that was made that a Savior was coming to this earth and is now here. So when they attack us, we can stand boldly because we know you as Lord and Savior. As the light of Jesus is extinguished in the sanctuary, Father, and carried out into the lobby, Lord, it's a reminder of the fact that we take the light of Christ here to a dark world and go out there and let the flame burn bright and we can light up the darkness for Jesus Christ, especially during this season that we call Advent. Bless us, Lord God. Challenge us. Let us focus on you for this season in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen. So as the light of Jesus goes out of the building, take it on out here with you. Tell people about Jesus like Barb did. How can you trust Jesus? How can you trust God with all that's going on right now? I said, is there a better time to trust God than now when all the stuff that's going on around? You know, if that's not a reason to trust God, I don't know what it is. You know, there's a saying that you never know that God is able until he needs to be able. Right? So you need him. So bless you all. We'll see you back here at 5 o'clock for the hanging of the greens and making wreaths and all that fun stuff. And then 6 o'clock, we'll gather for caroling and singing to the Lord. Um, I think that's going to be nice because there's enough people complaining to God. Might, might as well be some people get together to sing to God and bless him, right? All right. All right. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming out today. Keep Pastor Larry in prayer. He's happy he got his deer. <laughs> Another sign. <laughs> so, and God bless you guys. We'll see you hopefully tonight or Wednesday for prayer. Yeah.